Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest installation of our Florida Talks, Florida Humanities, Florida Talks at Home series. Uh, my name is Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director here at Florida Humanities. And I want to give just a brief introduction before our program. I think you're going to really enjoy um, our talk this evening with author Michael Tagayas. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of a couple of things before we really get into tonight's program. Uh, now, normally, Florida Humanities works with cultural partners across the state to put on programs like this one in person. But obviously, that can't happen right now. Our goal is to make this virtual series a regular event until we can begin convening in person once again. Um, I want to let everyone know that we are launching a special series on Florida's black history. Uh, the long history of race relations in Florida covers our state's history from European settlement to the present. Uh, the first program takes place tomorrow afternoon, that's Thursday at noon, uh, and it covers the Spanish colonial and slavery eras. You can register for that program by going to our website, floridahumanities.org. At the end of tonight's presentation, you will receive a short feedback survey in your email. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a minute to fill it out. Uh, just let us know how we did, the ways that we can improve next time, and the topics that you might be interested in hearing about in the future. If you have any questions uh, during Michael's presentation, go ahead and type them down in the chat field that you should see um, on the bottom right hand side of your screen. And we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible at the end of his presentation. Uh, your support, by the way, is essential for sustaining these programs. And so if you enjoy tonight's program, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org slash support to contribute to our organization and to continue to make these types of programs possible. Now tonight, we wanna to welcome Michael Tagayas. He is a New York Times bestselling author and a co-author of 28 books for adults and seven for children and young adults. His books include The Finest Hours, which we will hear more about shortly, and Above and Beyond, a history of the U2 pro spy program's role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Tagais. Thank you, Keith. And uh, Keith, thank you for all your hard work setting this up. Uh, and thank you all for attending. I hope that um, tonight's program feels almost like you're watching a documentary with the author. I'm going to give you kind of some of the behind the scenes research. And then the slides will really move the story along. There's a lot of slides, so it's a little bit like watching a movie. And um, there was a movie made of this particular book, and it, it goes by the same title, The Finest Hours. You can check it out on Netflix. Um, they did a good job. I would say probably 80% of the movie is true, which is unusual for Hollywood. And um, Keith was asking me earlier, uh, how did that come about? And I had to be honest, I said, it's luck because every author dreams of having their book made into a movie. And this one got picked up by Disney. And it was just the, the book found the right producer at the right time. And um, because so many books could make great movies. And so as I go through the slides, every now and then I might say, well, when you watch the movie, if you do, here's a little departure and here's why Hollywood decided to make that change. So I'm gonna get started. And at the end, again, we'll, we'll save time for uh, not just questions, but if you wanna talk about uh, the making of the movie and then some of the lessons I learned from going through this process and working with the, there's four main heroes in this story. Uh, what I learned from them as well. So in this little map, you see two oil tankers, the Pendleton and the Fort Mercer off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And um, uh, Massachusetts is where I grew up. And I didn't even know about this rescue. And yet it was the greatest small boat rescue in Coast Guard history. But um, the dotted line showed where they drifted to when a storm came in, a winter storm, and broke these two oil tankers in half. And so X marks the spot of the two rescues. So when I was talking with Disney, they said, we can't do 
two rescues because it'll confuse the reader. And actually, it's four rescues because the two ships split in half. Uh, they said, we're going to focus on the, the Pendleton. But I thought for tonight I'd cover both because um, the Fort Mercer rescue was just as dramatic. And you won't see that in the, the Disney movie. So we'll take the Fort Mercer bow section first. And as you can see here, it's in rough shape. There is no stern. The, uh, the ship split in half right behind the bridge. And uh, you had a casualty, a death right off the bat when one of the men tried to run towards the higher ground at the tip of the bow and he's going along that catwalk and a big wave came in and swept him right off it. Uh, the Fort Mercer rescue lasted over a period of two days. And on the, the first day, the waves were enormous. There are big 40, 50 foot waves crashing into these ships. And uh, most of the photos you see are taken during the second day when the waves uh, went down a bit. So the first thing the Coast Guard did, it was actually a mistake. They sent out these five young men from Nantucket, and it would have been a good 25 miles to get to the Fort Mercer uh, in a small 36 boat. They would have never made it. And what saved them was they found a light ship. And, and a light ship back, and I should have said this at the beginning, this, this event occurs in 1952. So that's why everything's in black and white. But amazingly, there are slides of the rescue. Uh, many of the slides were taken from circling aircraft. But they found a light ship. And what a light ship is, is a floating uh, Coast Guard ship at anchor at a dangerous spot, all lit up like a lighthouse to warn mariners away. And so those five young men who were sent out were able to climb aboard this Pollock Rip light ship. Uh, so they never even got to the sinking oil tanker. And it wasn't until the next day that a Coast Guard cutter arrived and you see them floating a raft over to the Fort Mercer. And uh, four men jumped, they missed the raft, and all four drowned. And I asked myself, why couldn't they just swim a couple feet to the life raft? And uh, the answer came after the book came out. It was someone in the audience when I was speaking on this topic, who said, I have a letter from my father. He's standing up on the cutter in your photo there. And in the letter, it explained that when the four men jumped, a gust of wind came, picked the life raft up and sent it tumbling, you know, quite a distance away from the men in the water. And that's why they couldn't make it. So I always found it just fascinating that tidbits of information would come up even after all the research was done. And um, even today, I still bump into somebody who has a connection and I learn another little piece of the puzzle. So when they realized the life raft isn't working, they sent down this small launch and um, I was able to, now I wrote this book in the early 2000s with a co-author. So I was able to find a lot of the rescuers around the country. And I found the gentleman standing up here. His name was Gil Carmichael and he was in Mississippi. And Gil said, uh, boy, were we afraid? He said, because even though it was the second day, the waves were still big. And when we made it to the oil tanker, Two men jumped. We were able to get them inside our little boat, but then the boat slammed into the steel hull of the oil tanker and broke our wooden ribs. And we had to get out of there before our little vessel sank. So here's a photo coming up of them coming back to the mothership. And the mothership was the Coast Guard cutter called Yakutat. And if you look carefully under the white blanket there, there's one of the survivors. Gil's at the stern. And I said to Gil, what happened next? And he goes, I don't remember. And I go, why? You remembered everything else. He goes, the cutter lowered the block and tackle to raise us back up. And it was swinging in the wind, hit me in the head, knocked me out cold. And he said, uh, when I came to, I was in my bunk bed. And he woke up and his first thought was, wow, I just had the most amazing dream <laughs> that I rescued two men off a sinking oil tanker. 
So he goes above deck and he looks out and he realizes, oh, my God, this really did happen. There's the, the tanker. It's still afloat. And by now they've gone back to trying to send life raft overs because there's still two last men left. Some have perished. Um, and these last two men, the way they send the life raft over is they shoot a line. The men on the tanker, you know, tie it off. So one end is going from the tanker to the life raft. And then the other piece of the line is going from the life raft back to the Coast Guard cutter. And the two men jumped into the raft, but they were so hypothermic, they couldn't manipulate their fingers to untie the line going back to the sinking ship. So they're stuck. And I asked a Coastie who I found named Bill Bleakley. He's in this photo as well. I said, Bill, what, what, what did you do? And he said, we had no choice but to put the cutter in reverse in hope that the line broke on the side towards the oil tanker so that we could then pull this life raft to us. And he said, when we started to put it in reverse, there was so much tension on the line, the life raft went way up in the air with these two men inside hanging on for dear life. And he said, I couldn't even look. And he said, then I heard a shout and the line snapped on the side towards the oil tanker. And he said, we were able to pull them close. And in this photo, you see one of the survivors down there and um, he's so frozen because this is all happening in the winter that he can't get out of the life raft. And so Gil and Bill Bleakley, the two men I interviewed, said we went down with ropes around us and uh, tied this survivor to us and then the other one and, and brought him up. And here they are taking the last one out of the life raft. And then something really odd happened. Bill said, so we're standing on the cutter as we get the last two men off the ship and somebody shouts, look, look, and we all look, and he's pointing back towards the oil tanker. And he said, right at that moment, the whole tanker just reared up in the air. And I said, did it, did it just flop over? Because it looks like it's standing on where it broke in half. And he said, no, he said it went slowly down like the Titanic. And he said, think about that. The ship stayed afloat for almost 48 hours and didn't sink until we got the last two men off. So those were the, the two luckiest men in the world. Um, you just never know when a, when a tanker or a ship, any ship is going to go down. One thing, so this was the bow section. I'm going to take you to the stern section next. But one thing I learned is, and I've seen this over and over in Coast Guard casualty reports, the stern always stays afloat longer than the bow. So if you're on a ship, be on the stern section. That was my takeaway. And then this was the last photo taken before it disappeared beneath the waves. So you're going to see some images from the stern section now, and it's, it's not as steep an angle in the water. But if you look carefully on the left there, you'll see some twisted metal of where it broke. And again, this shot was taken from a circling aircraft. And one of the guys I grew close to, one of the rescuers was named Lynn Whitmore. He's standing in the back here. He was the radio operator that got the SOS. He's standing next to the man with the beard. And it, it turned out he was from Newburyport, Massachusetts. So. It's always best when you can interview the person in person, gain their trust and confidence, and just let them talk with the tape recorder running. So Lynn said, uh, we were on an icebreaker when I got the SOS from the, the Fort Mercer, and um, he explained to me that, you know, the icebreakers, this one was called the East Wind, weren't really designed to do rescues, but of course, we, we went to the location. And a lot of times people think I served in the Coast Guard, but I, I have not served in the military. And I think that might have helped me as a writer because 
I'm writing the books for the general public, so I don't get caught up in, you know, military terminology. You know, in the Coast Guard, for example, they call the rescue swimmer a aviation survival technician. I call them rescue swimmers because I want my readers to be able to be right with me and, and read the book as if you're not some kind of expert. And um, so I asked um, Lynn, I said, so how do you break the ice? Do you ram it with the bow? And he said, no, no, no. You slide your bow up on the ice in the weight of the, the uh, cutter breaks it. And I said, well, what if the ice is too thick? And he said, I'll send you a picture. And uh, this was the picture he sent me. He said, we blow it up. And then we put our bow up and it keeps cracking and we slowly make our way. So he said, when we arrived at the sinking Fort Mercer stern, the first thing we did was send a life raft over. And there's a picture coming up showing that at least the men didn't have too, too far to jump. But um, they were not too wild about making that leap because if they miss the, the water's freezing, you're only going to last a minute or two. So one man jumped. And as they were bringing him back to the Coast Guard cutter, a wave hit the raft. In the way Len explained it, he said, it hit the raft so hard, it forced the man up into the air. He did kind of like a flip. And by luck, he landed right back into the raft. And, and we pulled him up and brought him on the cutter. And he was hypothermic. So we, we bundled him up and closed. That's him with the white towel around his neck. But he said no more men wanted to, to uh, leave that ship and risk jumping into a life raft when they saw that. And so by this time, again, we're in day two of this part of the rescue, a second Coast Guard cutter arrives in the background. That was the Akushnet from Maine. And on board was a captain, John Joseph. Unfortunately, he had passed away when I tried to interview him, but his son knew a lot about the rescue. And then his son surprised me and said, you know, my dad wrote an article for Reader's Digest, but they never accepted it. Would you like it about this rescue? And I was like, yes, it was 10 typewritten pages. It was almost like sitting down with Captain Joseph that you see in this picture here with one of the survivors. But what he did was, I'm going to go back. He brought that equipment right up next to the sinking oil tanker so that men could jump off it. And they did until one man hit a patch of ice and slid across the deck of the cutter and almost fell back into the ocean. And so the last 13 men on this section of the sinking oil tanker shouted, we're not leaving. They have made the decision they're going to stay with the ship, that it's more dangerous to try and get off it. And so there's Captain Joseph with one of the men who did jump on onto his ship. And Keith and I were talking about books and research. And, you know, one of the ways I was able to find out what the survivors were going through, because many had passed away, was to find old newspapers from around the country because many of them interviewed the survivors from their area. So I found at least four interviews in the uh, New Orleans Time Picayune. In this picture, they're with Captain Joseph, the one that um, saved the men who would jump. So what happened to the, the 13 men? By the way, these, this was a photo of some of the survivors. Their clothing was all wet, so people gave them borrowed, borrowed clothing. But what happened to the 13 men who stayed, it actually turned out to be a good decision. Um, one of them is up on the upper deck there waving to the aircraft, basically saying, we're OK. The ship, believe it or not, here it is, half a ship uh, retained power. So they were able to stay warm. They uh, they couldn't maneuver the ship. You know, barges had to come and and bring it back to shore, but they were able to stay warm. They later joked that they were able to cook a bacon and eggs breakfast. Um, so again, you know, if this had been on the other section of the Fort Mercer and they stayed on it, the thing suddenly sank and they all would have died. But in here, 
uh, that stern section never did sink. So this part of the, um, the rescue is not in the Disney movie. This next section that I'm going to talk about, the other tanker that splits in half, the Pendleton is. And what a coincidence, by the way, that um, the, uh, the two ships split in half on the same day, almost in the same location. Just really odd. So a lot of the action takes place at the Coast Guard Station in Chatham, and here it is back in the 1940s and 50s, and here it is today. It looks pretty much the same. So when Disney was filming the movie, they did some of the filming on location right here, but most of it, they used a giant warehouse at the old Four River Shipyard, and then inside of it built a half of an oil tanker to scale, a full-size oil tanker, and then built a swimming pool around it. It was incredible to see. And um, when I walked in the first time, I was just blown away. And I was able to be there when one of the rescuers was uh, sitting on the set, too. You know, he was in his 80s. You'll meet him in a minute, Andy Fitzgerald. And it was just so rewarding to have Andy sit there and see them making a movie about him and his, his rescue. So the first decision that comes about is um, the chief of that Coast Guard station named Daniel Clough has to make a decision. Do we send men out in small boats to try and rescue the Pendleton or not? In the movie, they kind of make him look like a villain, like a bad guy, that he was heartless. But in reality, he had, you know, he only had two choices. If I do nothing, people will criticize us. What good is the Coast Guard if you didn't go out? But if he sends his men out and his own men die in the big waves, they'll say, what were you thinking? So he was kind of in a no-win situation, and, and he decides that he's got to send his men out. And the first group he sent out were these four. Donald Bangs is in the light-colored hat. And um, Bangs' family, I interviewed them, and they said, um, you know, it was really difficult for Donald because even though he went out at night in these giant seas, this, this is the first night of the sinking ship, so the seas were a good 40 feet. They said he never did rescue anybody when he got to the Pendleton bow that you see here, only one man came out and he jumped. But at night in the big waves, they lost him. They couldn't get him. But Bangs, um, instead of heading back in after that, because nobody else came out to be rescued, I would have headed back in, that's for sure. Uh, he stayed out there all night circling the bow, hoping to save somebody. And then the main hero of this story, who uh, lived in Florida, Melbourne, Florida, Bernie Weber, I remember him asking me, are you going to mention Donald Bangs in your book? And I said, yes. And then Bernie would mention it again and again. And finally, I said, why do you keep asking? And Bernie said, because I love Donald Bangs. He was my mentor and he got no credit. But think about it. He stayed out there in the storm in a tiny boat all night just trying to save somebody's life. So for those of you that are familiar with Cape Cod, this is the elbow of Cape Cod at Chatham. And then below Chatham is Monomoy Island. And then where you see the K on this old chart, uh, that's where the rescues roughly were for the Pendleton. And um, Monomoy Island today, by the way, is just covered with seals. And that's what's brought in the great white sharks. So 20 years ago, we never had great white sharks off the Massachusetts coast in any number. And then now, boy, there must be 40 or 50. Uh, when I'm out there fishing, I am, I'm not seeing them, but I'm always aware they're around. Because if I'm like pulling in a striped bass and reaching over the side of the boat, other people have told me they reach down and a great white comes and just takes the fish right there next to the boat. It's unbelievable. So the commander bang sends out this man, Bernie Weber. And if you watch the finest hours movie, 
He's played by uh, Chris Pine. And opposite him is Casey Affleck as one of the, the survivors. And um, Bern was just great to work with. Um, he was very reluctant to do the book. Um, he just thought, yeah, it had been talked about way back in the 50s. And a lot of the reporters got the information wrong. So he was worried, you know, is Mike going to do it accurately? And I kept having to send him some of my other true rescue and survival books and putting him in touch with other rescuers and survivors until he felt comfortable enough to really open up and knowing that um, he would have a chance to look at anything I wrote about him. And if I made a mistake, he'd let me know. And so that opened up his his comfort level and, um, and, and it allowed us to become friends. So Bernie went out with three men. Now, in this photo, that's Bernie on the left, Richard Livesey in the middle. He, he was down in Florida as well in the Fort Myers area when I interviewed him. And then Andy Fitzgerald from the Colorado area. And the, the third uh, volunteer who's not in this picture was Irvin Mask from Wisconsin. And so they have to leave from the pier in the bar there. It's not a bar where you have a drink. The bar is the shallow area that they're going to have to take their 36 foot boat. Now the waves are bigger than the 36 feet. So they're going to have to take their tiny boat over this shallow area where the waves will be breaking. And, and Bernie said, that was my biggest fear that we'd never get over the bar to get to the stern section of the Pendleton. And they left from the fish pier in Chatham. Here it is today, kind of similar than yesterday. And, and in the beginning, they're in calm water. And uh, this is a really dramatic part of the book, you know, as they're heading out, um, they're, they're afraid. There's, you know, they all admitted their fear to me. And, um, but they're in calm water and in the distance, I like this part in the movie because it's, it's kind of like the movie Jaws, that, you know, like when you couldn't see the shark and it was just the music, it was scarier. Uh, in this case, when they're going out, they're in calm water, but in the distance, you just hear boom, boom. And it's the water hitting the Chatham bar, the waves breaking. And these guys look at each other thinking, oh my God, that's where we're going. So this is the vessel they were in. It was it was wooden. It doesn't even have a name, just a number, the 36500. Bernie would be standing behind those windshields there. And um, they were so nervous, they started singing. And I said, why would you sing at a time like this? And they said, to calm our fears. I said, what'd you sing? They said, Rock of Ages. And we have paintings and sketches of them going out, but because it's at night, we don't have any photos. So I called up a co couple of uh, Coast Guard contacts and I said, what would it have looked like? Can you send me a photo showing of as they approach the bar? And boy, this is exactly what it would have looked like, Bernie said. And I said, how would you know, Bernie? It was night. And he said, I, we had a little searchlight on the front of our boat big breaking waves. So in this modern day photo, that's a 47 foot Coast Guard motor lifeboat on the West Coast. Uh, it wasn't the Columbia Bar, it was one a little bit south of there, but look what happens. The, the wave just engulfs it. And if you look carefully, you see the tip of the bow coming up? and then gets totally rolled. The only reason they survived is they had their surf belts on that kept them with the vessel and the vessel was self writing I said to Bernie, is that what happened to you? And he said, no, no, no. And if I go back to the slide where they're approaching the breaking waves, he said, when we approached, I tried to get over the breaking waves, but he said, one wave hit us so hard, it 
blew out part of the windshield. And he said so much water came into the cockpit that it swept the compass right off its mount. And again, I would have headed back to shore saying, hey, I tried. I lost my compass. There's no way I'm going to find the oil tanker. And I certainly wouldn't want to go out without a windshield back over this bow. But if you read the Finest Hours book, you'll see that Bernie had been in a rescue a year earlier. That was a failure. And he didn't want that to happen again. So although he never really verbalized this to me, I think a driving force for him to try to get over the bar a second time without a compass and without a windshield was that failure weighed so heavily on him. So they make it over the bar. And this is what they find after groping around in the dark for a half an hour. Uh, this painting is very accurate. Bernie worked with the artist, Tony Falcone, who did it. And those, there were 33 men on this stern section of the Pendleton. And man, they wanted to get off this ship as fast as possible. So they're coming down the ladder, then they're jumping. Some are landing right on the little rescue boat, some in the water. Uh, Bernie couldn't just stay next to the ladder because if he did, a wave would slam him into the steel vessel. So he had to get one or two, then do a circle and come back, get one or two more. And when he reaches about 15, he goes, OK, I've exceeded the capacity of the lifeboat. We're riding really low in the water. Do I head in? Uh, he knows there's still some more men up there. He thinks there's four or five more. And he decides, I can't leave them. I'll never be able to get back out here. It, it turned out it wasn't just four or five more. Uh, again, he had 15, but there was a total of 33. So what? He's got uh, 18 more to rescue. And the boat's already overloaded. But somehow they kept pulling him into the boat until the 32nd man, who was the, the cook, and his nickname was Tiny Myers. He was this big fellow. He was six foot two, about 300 pounds. When he jumped, I remember um, Richard Livesey and Andy, two of the rescuers, said, we had him like in this photo, pulling him into the boat. But he said it was on the other side of our little uh, rescue vessel. And he was too big for us to get in. And so a wave came before we could get him in the boat, slammed us up against the steel hull, and it crushed Tiny Myers right before our eyes. So if you watch the Disney movie, they changed this part. They just showed Tiny Myers jumping and then sinking down in the water. And it's because they wanted to keep a PG-13 rating so that kids could see this, you know, action adventure story. But you know what really happened to Tiny Myers. And it was so rough on the rescuers because they, they almost had him in the boat. And to have him die right in front of their eyes, it haunted them for years. And then they got the last man off. Um, that was Casey Affleck in the movie. And then they had to head back to shore. And uh, Bernie said, put it in the book that I think I was guided by God because we didn't have a compass. And he said, all we did was kind of follow the waves back in. And he said, without me even knowing it, a wave picked us up and hurled us up and over the Chatham bar. And he said, we went from big 40 foot seas to six foot waves, which were nothing. And he said, I started tears. Uh, I couldn't believe that that we did it. And here they are coming back to the dock and people standing on the dock are thinking, oh, what a shame. They only got one survivor. But the vessel is like a clown car in a parade. A hatch opens up and uh, watch this. All these survivors come pouring out, still in these big, bulky life jackets. And to this day, it's hard to imagine how they got 32 survivors on that vessel. Uh, particularly if you you're able to, if you ever come up to Cape Cod, you can go on the boat. It's at Rock Harbor, and you'll go. There's no way. But as Andy said, if your life depends on it, you find a way and you stack on top of each other. 
you curl around Bernie's feet, you just find anything to hold on to. And I love this. This is probably my favorite slide of the bunch. Everybody's left except Bernie, who's up high, and Irvin Mask down low. And you can just see the relief in Bernie's face. He's you know holding his head in his hands. He's just exhausted. And so this is kind of where the movie ends with Bernie getting together with his fiance at the end, but I'll take you a couple more slides to give you a little bit of the backstory. Uh, they all went back to the Coast Guard Station, survivors and rescuers, and these, this photo went out across the country. On, it was on the front page of newspapers everywhere. I like to joke, though, even a hero, Bernie's on the left, even a hero makes a mistake, he forgot to zip his fly. <laughs> Bernie will forgive me for that joke. And uh, here's some photos inside the command center of rescuers. One's on the ground, one's frozen in the chair trying to get warm. Uh, the media was there interviewing survivors live. So it's just total pandemonium at the Coast Guard station. And more pictures. And it was very interesting. I asked Bernie, I said, so what was it like to be called America's hero? And he said, I hated it. And I said, why? He said, it became a burden. He said, like the Coast Guard would ask me to speak to rotary groups and things like that. I became their best recruiting tool. And he said, I was only 24 years old. I was very uncomfortable in front of a crowd. And you know that, the ship, the part that they did the rescue on that stern, after they did the rescue, a wave did knock it over and then it drifted to a shoal and it stayed there. There, You could see the Jacob's Ladder coming down off the side, stayed there up until the blizzard of 1978. And then, um, so people would back before 78 could, could climb on board and take off pieces of the ship. And then remember, I, I mentioned the bow, only one man jumped out and Donald Bangs couldn't get him. Uh, I did find a Coastie who was sent out to the bow, which also ended up on a shoal. And his job was to take off the dead bodies. And um, he uh, said, I didn't get out there till three days later. And you, he said, you could see the seas are flat. But... Um, I was still afraid. His name was Mel Guthrie, and Mel said, so I entered the vessel through the through the broken bridge, but he said there were no bodies there. I said, what'd you do? And he said, I had a little flashlight, went all the way, you know, through the passageways to the very tip of the bow, and in a room where they stored paint under some burlap bags was one sailor frozen into a block of ice. And he said, all the others were gone. And we, we, to this day, we don't know what happened. There were six others, one being the captain of the ship. Maybe they tried to put their own rescue boat over, but their bodies were never found. And then I close on a, uh, a positive note. The, the vessel that Bernie used was found all rotted and in decay behind the Salt Pond Visitor Center years ago. And volunteers realized, hey, this was the boat that did the Pendleton rescue. And people from Orleans and Chatham and surrounding towns uh, banded together and fixed it up so that today it's ship shape. And that's why uh, you can see it at uh, Rock Harbor. And uh, if you're interested on my website, there's a, an interview with one of the uh, rescuers, and then there's some video from some of the other uh, survival at sea books from the actual rescues. In the the website is just michaeltogias.com, T-O-U-G-I-A-S, and you can also order uh, personalized copies of the books there if you want to give them as gifts, and. The, the propeller from the original rescue boat, they put it on a, uh, a boulder overlooking the Chatham bar. So if you go to Chatham, 
You can visit the Coast Guard station. You can stand at this boulder and kind of get the feel of the open ocean and the waves breaking out there on the bar. And there's, there's the website, the strange spelling of the last name. I wish my last name was Smith as an author. And we'll turn it back over to the audience for questions, but I'll talk, you know, just a little bit about um, uh, the movie. It was just such a thrill to be able to see it happening. And, you know, when they invite the author onto the set, I, I quickly learned a rule. You're invited to observe, but you're not invited to comment. <laughs> so, so if I saw them, you know, doing something that was over the top or something that could never be true, like, you know, after they did the rescue, they showed all the survivors on the bow of the little rescue boat coming back towards shore. That would have never happened because they would have been swept into the ocean with these giant waves. They were either down around Bernie's feet or in the survival um, uh, compartment on top of each other like Lincoln logs. But at that point, you know, I quickly learned just go with it and be grateful that you're enjoying this great experience. You'll probably never have this again with one of your books. It's so hard to have a movie made. So once I got that through my thick head, then I just, I really love the process. So Keith, um, did you have any comments or questions or anything from the audience? So there are a couple of questions. First of all, I just wanted to thank you again for um, presenting that really, I think, riveting and, and fascinating story. Um, I think one of the things that would probably help in terms of starting off our conversation is if you could just give maybe a little bit of clarification, um, what initially caused um, those ships to come into distress and ultimately break up? And then um, did they send out a mayday or some sort of warning, um, you know, either before they ran into problems or as they ran into problems? Or how, how did the Coast Guard, I guess, become aware that these ships were in distress? The, um, you know, it's a great point because, you know, for any of us, if we're ever out on the ocean and we get in trouble, it's, it's best not to wait until you're in the mayday situation. It's best to try and let the Coast Guard know, hey, we have an issue. We're not in a mayday situation yet, but this is going on. And on the Fort Mercer, they were able to do that before it split in half. They knew something was wrong in this storm. So they did get out a uh, distress signal. And then they, when it split in half, they were able to get out the mayday on the Pendleton. It happened so suddenly they never even got out a, a mayday, and the radio uh, communication was was broken. So that the men on the Pendleton wondered, "Is anybody ever going to come for us?" So, and then to the first part of your question, why did it happen? Well, the storm was a big part, the giant waves, but also the poor construction of these ships. They were built during the World War II period when we were in a real rush to build as many ships as we could. And Keith, you and I were talking about this early. I did a book called So Close to Home about the U-boats that came off Florida, went all the way to the Mississippi River and were sinking, sinking US ships left and right. I never knew that, they never taught me that in high school or college. And so we were trying to uh, replace the ships as fast as we could so that construction was really quick and sometimes we didn't use the best metal. And so what I, what I believe happened is if you have say a wave under the stern and another under the bow, but nothing in the middle of the ship, all that weight of the ship is in the middle and that probably formed the, the fracture. And they, they called the steel, they even had a name for it, dirty steel. Um, another thing they did was um, instead of some rivets in places, they did welding. But the, the, to me, the strangest part was what are the odds that you'd have two oil tankers, the exact same size, 
the exact same hour, both split in half and almost the same location. It's just like mind boggling. So that's what overwhelmed the Coast Guard. It wasn't just, you know, rescuing two pieces of Fort Mercer. Now you had two pieces of the Pendleton. And I think that also brings up another great point from um, our audience. And before uh, we got started with our program this evening, you and I were talking, and I think you mentioned that this is like your sixth book that you've written um, about rescues and, and survivors at sea. And I think uh, certainly based on that experience and a lot of the research that you've done, um, do you think that a rescue like this or, or something comparable with all the technology that we have with improvement in, in ship construction and design, would it be just as daunting today to have a, a rescue mission like this? Or because of the more sophisticated equipment, do you think it would be easier to execute? You know, I think today's Coast Guard would do, well, I know this actually, they would do a risk assessment before they sent men out. And they probably, at the peak of that storm would not have attempted the rescue because they'd be putting so many of their own men and women in danger. Now, today's Coast Guard also has the use of, of helicopters, but in a snowstorm with sleet, then you had the issue of icing up on a helicopter. So perhaps they would have waited longer and maybe you would have had even more casualties. It's hard to say. Um, they would have got out and with bigger cutters and the aircraft, they, they definitely would have used the helicopters when that uh, red zone, if you will, went down a little bit. Um, I learned in a book, by, probably my favorite book of the, the six on these rescues uh, at sea is A Storm Too Soon. And, and there the helicopter crew goes into a hurricane 300 miles off the Carolinas, and they have to put the rescue swimmer down in 80 foot waves. And that just like blew my mind. I said, that's in the red zone. And they said, well, we, we thought it was borderline and we knew these men in the life raft were gonna die any minute. So, you know, sometimes they, the Coast Guard leaves it up to the people on the scene. In this case, it was the pilots to make the helicopter pilots to make the uh, decisions. So it's, it's a tough question to answer how the rescue would have gone. I think it would have gone a lot better, but it, I don't think they would have gone out immediately like they tried to do uh, with the finest hours. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the concept of going into a perfectly good helicopter into a hurricane and then dropping a, a a uh, rescue swimmer into 80 foot sea. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to process that one, I think just yeah. a little bit more, yeah. but. That's one of the one, that's one of the videos that I believe is on my website. So the, the, the life raft in the 80 foot waves look like the size of a dime and there's three men on it. It's just unreal. I, I'm still on the fence about if I'm gonna watch that video. I might, <laughs> I might have to, but we'll, we'll see about that. Um, it, also in your presentation, you talked about how papers um, around the country would interview some of the survivors that are local to those papers. So I wonder if you could just remind us what is, I, I believe there is a Florida connection um, to this story. And I wonder if you might be able to talk about that a little bit. Well, the, the big Florida connection was both um, Bernie and Richard Lipsy, the two of the four main rescuers. Uh, lived in Florida. Bernie was in Melbourne. Richard was up in, I believe it was Punta Gorda. And um, it was just so nice to be able to be at Richard's house and interview him. And I'll never forget, he said, nobody even knows I was involved in this rescue, Mike. You're the first person that's brought it up since they had a little reunion. He said, but all these years went by before and then after when it just kind of got forgotten, we kind of got this brief, brief, um, you know, notoriety. But then the Coast Guard later did recognize their their bravery and they commissioned a new cutter from Florida called the Bernard C. Weber uh, after Bernie Weber. Um, that wasn't that long ago. 
And um, that was really nice that after all these years, they they didn't forget him. And I, and I believe it launched from uh, Miami. They had I wasn't there, but I think that's where they had the ceremony. And I think that brings up actually another great question, which is, um, and I think we had talked about this a little bit, that you spent a lot of time, I think, talking to different like Coast Guard groups and, and uh, folks like that. And so to your knowledge, is this rescue in any way, is this sort of a textbook um, case study in terms of how to conduct a rescue, the way that you make decisions leading up to it, and then um, the things that you do in, in the middle of the rescue? Or is there something else that, that kind of takes over as sort of that standard textbook approach? Boy, that's that's an interesting question, too, because, it you know, because it happened so long ago and so much has changed within the Coast Guard. First, you know, the, doing a risk assessment before they send people out and, you know, so much better uh, quality materials, if you will, to work with. Like those men, uh, they weren't even in like, you know, the latest neoprene jacket or boots or anything like that they they had on hand-me-down old navy coats they weren't even coast guard coats uh, so they were just freezing cold but you know when you mentioned the word textbook for me that the takeaway was it was for me a textbook case of how a person like bernie should conduct themselves and not everybody would some other people might be I don't know, like a glory hound, but I'm going to tell you a little story that speaks to the character of, of Bernie. And he's passed away, unfortunately. I wish he was here to hear me say this. Um, he, when it was over, the Coast Guard Commandant's office called him and said, we're going to give you the gold life-saving medal, and the, which is the highest honor you can get. And we're going to give your crew the silver and be up at Boston at such and such a day for a big ceremony. And Bernie goes, thanks. Then he goes, then he goes, shouldn't my crew get the gold? Because they volunteered. I was ordered. And um, uh, they said, no, it's too late for that. And the way Bernie explained it to me, he said, I was about to hang up. And it just didn't feel, feel right. And I said, they should get the gold. And they say, no, Weber, this is how we're doing it. And Bernie's got the backbone to go, you know what? If you don't give them the gold, I'm not going to accept mine. And he called their bluff and all four got the gold. So, you know, he knew those three guys put their lives on the line too, just as much as him. And he didn't want to hog the glory. So, um, you know, they didn't even know Bernie did that behind the scenes. And I just thought, man, that now that to me is real character. I mean, that's a very phenomenal instance in terms of talking about someone's character. And I want to circle back to that, I think, um, in our last question. But I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, you know, related to your work as an author. Um, you know, as I read in your introduction, you've written 28 books um, for adults, and you've written seven for uh, for children and for young adults, and you know that's just an incredibly prolific career um, in terms of a writer. And so, I wonder if you could just talk for a moment about your writing process and how are you able to sustain? I think the extraordinary level of production um, just this over this period of time. Well, I guess number one would be you really have to love your your topic because you're going to be investing so much of your time. And, you know, when the deadline is approaching, you're going to have to give up a lot of fun things in your life to devote to this. So you, you really have to be interested in the topic. I find for me, the research is a joy. I mean, I just love it. Love finding the people. It's like a treasure hunt. Love interviewing them. The writing will always be lonely work, at least to me. And people always go, oh, well, you must have a, a real disciplined formula like Stephen King, who writes from, say, you know, 7 a.m. to noon every day. I go, no, I have no schedule at all. I may go two months without writing a word and just be out on the ocean fishing and then all of a sudden go, oh, my God, the deadline's approaching. I got to get in the zone and then I'll be 
writing a little bit in the morning and then a little bit after lunch, then take a nap and then write in the evening. So I have no schedule and I really don't know other authors that work that way. All of them seem to have a formula that works and I have no formula. Every, every book is different. So, you know, in a nutshell, you, you've got to love the topic and love the research. And then the writing is just pure discipline. Um, I'm doing a book now for most of my uh, books for young adults are called Middle Reader Age, 8 to 12. And The Finest Hours is one that was converted or adapted. And I'm doing one that's um, called In Harm's Way that I didn't write. It was a best-selling author. Doug Stanton wrote it for adults. But I've been hired to adapt it for middle readers. And that's what I'll be doing all day tomorrow and um, it's just, it's hard work. It's just converting something for adults into young adults, shortening sentences, shortening paragraphs, explaining things that a young person may not know. So there's no getting around that, but the payoff is when you hold the book in your hand at the end, you, you've got to have that feeling of, wow, it was worth it. And for me, it was worth handing it, you know, I never was able to hand the finest hours to Bernie because he had passed away. So I was at his funeral and his grandchildren was there and the book had just came out and I was able to give them a couple copies and say, I just got these. Here's what your grandfather did. That, that just made it all worth it. I can absolutely imagine that. And again, thank you for for really helping to bring this incredible story to us. Um, and I think the last question that I would like to, to ask for the evening is that um, when we were talking earlier, one of the things that um, you mentioned and that I noticed on your author website is that you um, give a lot of talks and lectures about leadership and, and leadership lessons. And um, you know, out of curiosity, I was just wondering, you know, based on a lot of this work that you've done in terms of, of looking at heroism and looking at the way that people exercise leadership in these really extreme situations, certainly 2020 is, I think, as extreme as it kind of gets. Um, I wonder if there's been a leadership lesson that you learned or that you've seen from all of these books that you've written that you feel like is really applicable to our, our current moment? Yes, there's one that comes right to the top of my head. And this, this comes from mostly what I call extraordinary survivors, people who survived an ordeal that I think I could have never got through. And when I get to know them after a series of interviews, I begin to, to probe deeper and deeper. And, off, and, and more than one has said something similar, but to the effect of, Mike, I didn't try to look way down the road about ultimate rescue. I looked at what do I have to do in the next half hour or hour to keep fighting? And, you know, one in particular, Ernie Hazard from my book, Fatal Forecast, he even said, I never thought I would be rescued. He was out there in late November, alone in the North Atlantic, where the water is cold in and out of a life raft because it's being flipped by the waves. And he said, I didn't even think I'd make it. He said that may be a, an outside chance. He lasted three days. And the way he did it was the power of little steps, just getting through each hour. And he would tell himself, Ernie, I'm going to go down fighting. You know, I'm not going to give up. If I die, I'm going to go down fighting. And I kind of love that approach for when difficult times hit us like now or anybody else. It's like, all you got to do is do your best for that particular day. Don't look too far down the road. And pretty soon you've strung a whole bunch of good days together. And maybe that's helped me through like this period where, for example, my uh, two children are uh, working in um, one was in Hong Kong, the other was in Thailand. I haven't been able to see them forever, but it, it uh, helps them and myself to go, hey, 
All you got to do is your best. Don't worry about seeing me. Don't worry about when this thing is going to be over. Just do your best each day at your job and take time out to give yourself pats at the on the back. You two are both doing great in your respective lives. Um, you know, and, may, and maybe their journeys of, of being world travelers had something to do with me taking them when they were kids to various interview sessions and then listening to these survivors and rescuers and kind of taking it all in and going, you know, I'm not going to lead a life of fear. I'm going to be out there doing it. And both both my kids are that way. They're fearless. I'm the, I'm the big chicken in the family. Well, no, I think that's an absolutely phenomenal um, lesson and something for us to, to certainly keep in mind. Um, so again, Michael, thank you so much for um, the time that you were able to spend with us this evening. Remember, you can go to his website, michaeltogaius.com, to see more of his books that he has for sale and a lot of interesting other research and tidbits um, that he's come across in doing a lot of this work. And again, thank you for joining us this evening for our Florida Talks at Home program. We look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow afternoon for our latest and special iteration of Florida Talks on the long history of race relations in Florida. So again, thank you so much and have a fantastic evening.